continue? Yes. Yep, and we are live. All right. Did you click continue there, Carla? Yeah. Okay, you're all set. All right. So good afternoon, right. everyone. So good afternoon, right. everyone. So good afternoon, right. everyone. So good afternoon. Is that me, Steve? So That's you. Um, okay, mute I YouTube. It I got it. Yeah, there's going to be at least one little glitch every single time, right? <laughs> so Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your lunch hour with us. Um, here I have uh, my co-chair, Stephen, and my name is Sarah Gott Wallace. I'm one of the other co-chairs of the Dr. Talbot Spivak Holocaust Memorial Committee. So as I say, thank you so much for spending your time with us. And thank you so much to Mrs. Carla Beninga, who's agreed to share her story with us. You know, Holocaust education is so, so important. And it seems like the more time continues on, the more years pass, the more important it becomes. So I'm so grateful to you, Carla, for agreeing to share your story. You know, we couldn't do this without you. You were integral to this. So thank you very, very much. Today, Carla is going to be sharing her story as a Holocaust survivor in Holland. And hopefully some of you have seen Holocaust survivor stories before. You've heard them, you've heard them tell their story. I encourage you to listen to as many survivor stories as you possibly can. And this is for a few different reasons. Today, pretty much all day, we're going to be live streaming survivor talks. So please try to catch as many of those as you can. Because regardless of how many you've heard speak before, every single survivor story is vastly different. The person could have been in the same family, from the same location, placed in the same camp or otherwise detention camp location, and the story can be vastly different. But the other important reason why we need to hear as many survivor stories as possible is because one day these amazing, beautiful, brave people aren't going to be with us and able to share their story any longer. So it's going to be our job, it's going to be up to us to carry the beacon of truth into the future decades. It's gonna be up to us to stand up in the face of Holocaust denial and say, you are wrong. The Holocaust happened, I met someone, I heard their story and I know that the Holocaust happened. This is a true story and we have to stand up to deniers and naysayers. So what we're going to do is Carla is going to be sharing her story, and then you folks out there in virtual land, you can watch us on YouTube. If you have a question, just throw it into the chat, and I'll be moderating questions at the end of Carla's talk. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mrs. Carla Beninga. All righty. Welcome, everybody. My paper is called Adolescence Lost, and after I've read it, you'll know why I chose that title. World War II for the Netherlands began on May 10, 1940, and ended on May 5, 1945, when the German occupational forces surrendered and beat their retreat to the Heimat. That day, May the 5th, was an unforgettable day. For the people in Holland, the war and the occupation lasted five years. In the ongoing sweep of history, five years is not such a long time. But for those who had felt in their bodies and souls the oppression, suffering, brutality, hunger, and death, these are five very long years. Worst of were the Jews, few survived. Most perished in Hitler's death camps. The word Holocaust will forever be called by the horrible fate that struck them. We cannot comprehend this monstrous rape on a segment of the human race. Germany's capitulation in 1945 formally marked the end of the war that engulfed virtually all of Europe. The armistice was also much more. It sealed the fate, it, it sealed the fate of Nazism 
a demonic system that was fueled by the belief in the superiority of the so-called Aryan race. The world remains horror-struck at the forces of evil that lashed the world and tore it apart, wiping out millions of lives. With a measure of incredulity, we ask how a civilized nation, a nation that gave us Beethoven, Handel, and Brahms, could sink to such depths of depravity. Um, I just want to sh show you a book that they have, which has all the names of the Dutch people who were killed in the concentration camps. There were 140,000 Jews in Holland before the war started and 30,000 survived, 110,000 just Dutch Jews. Well, how did it start? On May the 10th, 1940, is a Friday morning I will never forget. It was four in the morning when my sister and I were awakened by shooting, resulting in a plane crash less than half a mile from our home. It was the beginning of the invasion of Holland. Death was everywhere, around every corner in every street, death came as a German soldier. He left behind a swastika for every grave. A ranting and raving furor convulsed the world with death. Unprepared, Dutch soldiers fought with weapons dating back to World War I. Defense ended in death. The war lasted only five days. We were loving, living in The Hague at that time. Um, where I lost my... Um, we were yeah, in The Hague at that time. I was a 12-year-old seventh grader, and my sister was 10. We could not believe that anyone could bother our peaceful small country, but we were important because of our long coastline, the access to Great Britain. We spent five days during which there actually was little fighting, playing Monopoly with our friends, a game which I've seldom played since. On the fifth day, even playing Monopoly abruptly ended. Sometime that afternoon, Rotterdam, only 20 miles from where we lived, was bombed. We sat in our basement for what seemed like eternity, and when it stopped, we knew that the war was over. Little did we know that it had only just begun. That evening, the four of us, along with some very close friends, drove to Eymuiden, a harbor town on the North Sea. My parents, fearing what was coming, decided that we had to leave the country. I can still hear my mother tell her housekeeper where she could reach us in England after the war. We went in our friend's car. However, he was so shaken that he could not drive. My father, who had had a terrible automobile accident in 1933 and who had not driven since, took over. How we arrived in a mountain, I will never know. Barricades were everywhere. When we got there, the town was aflame. This was a city with hundreds of oil tanks, which were all set afire. We found ourselves at the docks with thousands of other persons, mostly Jewish, all trying to leave the country. It became soon apparent that this would be impossible. There was one small boat with standing room only, which was still leaving. 
The last one said sailed that afternoon. My parents decided that the small boat would be suicide. We later found out that it hit a mine, a mine less than a mile from the shore. We drove home in complete silence, knowing and fearing the worst. Everywhere in conquered Europe, the German occupation forces vigorously implemented Hitler's racial policies. For the Jewish question, as he called it, Hitler adopted the final solution, extermination. To deal with the Jews of occupied Europe, the Germans created an efficient apparatus that rounded up Jews and transported them to special extermination camps many of them in Poland. There the prisoners were worked to exhaustion before being shot or gassed. To Trebrinka, Bergen-Belsen, Sobibor, Dachau, but especially Auschwitz, the long slow trains began to move in 1942, carrying their wretched human freight to destruction. Before the nightmare had passed, an estimated six million Jews had been systematically murdered. In Amsterdam, the crowds line up every day on the brick pavement in front of the house at number 263, Prinsengracht. They appear to be mostly tourists laughing and chatting happily in a variety of languages. Once they are in the side, inside the building, their mood changes. There's nothing happy or funny about genocide. They look at the hinged bookcases that once concealed a haven for a group of Jews hiding from the Nazis. They climb the narrow wooden steps behind the bookcase steps that must have echoed thunderously with the pounding of hobnailed boots the day the stormtroopers arrived. They, whis they whisper to each other as they inspect the camp quarters where eight uh, people hid for 25 months before discovered and hauled off to concentration camps. And they watched silently the slides made from a Nazi film showing a roundup of Jews and a train ride to the gas ovens. The Anne Frank House attracts thousands of visitors a year, drawn here by a young girl's account of life in hiding. I was more fortunate than Anne. I survived the Holocaust. My story began much the same way as Anne's. After the Five Day War ended, our lives did not change immediately. At that time, only German soldiers occupied Holland. We were allowed to return to school and resume a fairly normal life. I finished the seventh and eighth grade at our regular school, but we knew that this situation was soon, it was soon to change. We were hoping that the war would not last too long and that our lives would not be endangered as much as my parents and their peers expected. This was not to be. In 1990, 1941, the attics began. Just must, Jews must wear a yellow star. Jews must hand in their bicycles and radio. Jews are only allowed to do their shopping between three and five o'clock and then only in shops which bear the sign Jewish shops. Jews are banned, banned to uh, from trains and all public transportation are forbidden to drive. 
Jews must be indoors by eight o'clock and cannot even sit in their own backyard after that hour. Jews may not take part, part in public sports. Jews may not visit non-Jews. Jewish children may not attend public or private schools. I was very sad that I could no longer go to school with my friends or even visit them. I was the only Jewish student in my class. I began the ninth grade in the special school where all of the teachers and students were Jewish. Many of the teachers were called professor, not allowed to teach at the university any longer. The learning process was far from the norm and the curriculum was quite strenuous. So strenuous in fact that half of my class was not promoted to the 10th grade. My sister and I had to walk to school each morning, an hour's walk. Our books were very heavy to carry, so my father arranged for one of his employees a Gentile to deliver the books to deliver the books to the school and pick them up in the afternoon. The beginning of 1942 school year saw our school population diminished by the day. It was about that time that the so-called voluntary transportation began. Jews were promised a work camp situation in Germany where they would be well treated. They went, mostly poor Jews, lambs, let slaughtered. Also the exorazias, the roundups were beginning. Each day another student failed to show in class. In November 42, all Jews residing in Holland had to move to Amsterdam. The Germans arrived at our house in The Hague and told us to leave all furniture except for our beds. We were allowed to keep our clothes and personal belonging. My parents wisely had already stored our silver and artworks at the home of Gentile friends. At that time to a Walter, a so-called caretaker, had taken over my father's business since he was considered incapable of running a business he had been running for years. Ironically, our house was later bombed by the British Air Force who had mistaken that area for military headquarters. We moved into a small apartment in Amsterdam sharing a with a cousin of my father's and his wife. Again, we had to find a Jewish school, this time an even farther walk, and no one to carry our books. Extracurricular activities did not exist, but we got our exercise walking. I often went to see my grandmother who was in poor health I was living in with my aunt and uncle and their three children. By the spring of 1943, all Jews still remain in Amsterdam. May, many had already gone into hiding or had been taken to the camps, had to move into a ghetto within the city. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Um, let me see what we were. Um, by the spring of 1943, all Jews remaining in Amsterdam um, had to move to Getty, ghetto was in the city. Uh, our new apartment was in the labor type housing on the third floor. Uh, there was no 
There were no washing facilities except the kitchen sink, no hot water, and no refrigerator. My father built a wash stand as well as a wooden box outside a window to keep our perishables. We had to use a public bathhouse for Jews only, of course, to take our shower. One learns to do without. But we were still together. German SS made their weekly round trips, ringing all doorbells to find out which apartment housed Jewish families and which of those families were on an exempt list. Because my father worked in a Jewish, Jewish grocery store, we were still on that list. One night, our doorbell rang. They were there. Our luck held. They were still looking for non-exempt Jews. Our neighbors across the hall were rounded up that night. The next day, we got word that my grandmother, my aunt and uncle, and my three cousins were rounded up. My grandmother, too ill to walk, was hauled off on a grocery cart. They were transported to Westerbork, a Dutch concentration camp, which served as a transit camp to the camps in Germany and Poland. They were transported to Auschwitz almost immediately. Two of my cousin, both girl, girls, miraculously survived. They knew that their parents and little brother arrived at Auschwitz at a time that there was no gas. This is an unconfirmed report and were burned alive. Another sister of my father and her husband were also arrested about the same time. They died in Sobibor. My mother's parents could not face deportation. My grandfather, who started as a delivery boy, had built up a large corporation. When they took this away from him, he became very depressed also because he was losing his eyesight at that time. They always told us that if, if told to leave their home, they would have to be carried out. One night before we moved to Amsterdam, they turned on the gas in the kitchen where a faithful housekeeper from found them next morning, still holding hands. We at least know where they are buried and can visit their grave. The Germans, angry that they escaped them, poured gasoline on their house and burned it to the ground. There is another house now. Years ago, I put the first pole in the ground after the war, but I have no feeling for it but I still have beautiful memories of the good times spent in the home of my wonderful grandparents during the first 12 years of my life. The weekly arm drops continued. I still experience that feeling of fear whenever I hear a doorbell or phone ring in the middle of the night. I have become a parent of our exam status would no longer protect us. It was time to go into hiding. My parents felt it'd be best for if, if our family split up since chances of being caught were greater when large groups hit together. We would not know where the others were hiding. My sister and I were aided by uh, the college student underground organization, which was part of a larger underground network. During the last few weeks before we went into hiding, we dropped off a few items such as clothing, a few books, some cherried objects, but no photographs. At a safe house, until we had everything there we would need, it would have looked conspicuous to carry a suitcase wearing the yellow star. The day we had all been dreaded 
had finally arrived. We set our dining room table, the only room in our little flat that could hold all four of us, and found we could not speak. What went through our minds? Would we ever see each other again? Where were we going? How would we cope by ourselves without our parents? I was 15, my sister almost 14. How my parents must have suffered. I was picked up first, my parents left next, leaving my sister, whose underground worker had not yet arrived. The fears my parents must have had leaving her by herself defy description. She was skipped up and picked up less than an hour later. My underground worker, whose name I never discovered, took me to the safe house to pick up my belongings after I torn off that horrible yellow star, hoping I would never have to wear it again. We went by train to the home of a Catholic family in the south of Holland. I was sure I would be spotted immediately and hauled off to a camp, but my fear was unfounded. I stayed with this family on and off during most of my hiding years. I went into hiding in May 43, and the American army liberated us in September 1944. The underground network also had a courier system whereby we could keep in touch with our families and who would bring our food rationing coupons. There was danger in this also, as we never had the same contact twice, and you never knew who you, whom you could trust. My story is not unique. Thousands of Jews who are at Holland were hidden by people who could not and did not believe in the atrocities perpetuated by the Germans. My story is just one of many. At my hiding place, I was introduced as a visiting cousin whose mother was ill. I could therefore not attend school. However, I studied from the daughter's books and later took some private lessons from some understanding nuns. Somehow I managed to obtain necessary high school books and keep up with the curriculum and awarded my high school diploma after the war without having to go back to school. This diploma was recognized by the University uh, of Amsterdam, which I later attended. The family with whom I was hiding had a son, Jan, in a war camp in Germany. When he escaped and joined the underground, the Germans came looking for him. It became too hot for me there, so I left, though, though, although I periodically returned. I went from house to house sometimes. I rode my bike and brought daylight. I had false and, uh, identification papers. At other times, I had to sneak out in the middle of the night. I was always one step ahead of the Germans. In the 16 months that I was hiding, I stayed in a dozen different places. One home, which I stayed, had a family with seven sons. They were hiding three other Jewish girls. When the family started to inquire, bring out about my father, my parents' finances to see if I would make a suitable wife to one of their sons and encourage them to make passes. I decided it was time to move again. One time I stayed in the row house with two school teachers. During the day when they were working, I could not move and flush the toilet. I spent my days reading and studying. When I could no longer stand this pressure, my underground contact found me another place to stay. 
I was barely 16 at that time, but I was constantly making adult decisions. My sister and I went into this war as children and came out as adults. A fact that my parents found difficult to deal with after the war. We never were teenagers. This was adolescence loss. The area where I was hiding was a coal mining community and the various families that I lived with were simple people and not well off. Bathrooms were an unknown luxury and the fact that I washed and bathed myself every day was something they had never encountered. It was strictly wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday and keep the same underwear on the whole week. I contributed to the household by cleaning, washing, ironing, and darning what must have been thousands of black socks. That's another thing I will never do again. Food was not plentiful during this time, but I did not starve. My diet consisted mainly of bread and potatoes, and I became quite overweight. Many fared far worse, eating tulip soup, tulip bread, and even plain tulip bulbs. Many people during the last winter of the war in 1945, actually starved to death, mostly the poorer ones who could not afford black market prices. In spite of all the misery, fear, and pain, a sense of humor had to be maintained. maintained. There were even parties given by the underground, but there were few and far in between. In many ways, I was lucky. All the families that hit me did so out of charity and love. Many others, others however, as in the case of my husband's family, demanded huge sums of money. There was always a threat that you would be turned in if the money ran out or if they wanted more than you could afford. One difficult I experienced was the fact that I could not talk to my parents. As a person going into adulthood, I had many questions, including those about sex, and I had no one to talk to. So I would send a letter for, sometimes for months for her reply. Although all these problems seemed very minor compared to the horrors we experienced at the time, it was very difficult. My first period, although informed and expecting this, in doing my years in hiding, no one to share it with, no one who understood my feelings. A month before our liberation, the Germans came looking for Jan again. I was not there at the time because of his involvement in the underground. Since they could not find him, they took his father instead and executed him a week before liberation. His mother, a kind but fairly ignorant woman to her dying days, accused her son of killing his father. Jan lived this, with this guilt for the rest of his life. He died in 1985 in a mental hospital. The area where I was hiding is in the southern part of Holland. We were liberated by the American army in 1944. I cannot describe the feeling when we saw the Germans retreat. No one dared go outside for being shot. Two hours after the Germans left, the American troops arrived to be free again. We did not think it would ever happen. We walked and walked so much that so that I hurt not having been outside for months. An American soldier gave me a K ration and I, thinking it was a chocolate bar, I ate the whole thing. I was sick for two days. I won't get angry at the soldier for throwing out bacon drippings. It was also the first time 
that I ran into discrimination. I was talking to a black American soldier when a white officer motioned me aside. He warned me not to talk to black soldiers. And I told him that I had been liberated by the American army and I loved all Ameri Americans and did not care what calls they were. He shrugged and said, you better be careful. Now that I was free, I was really on my own. Although still staying with the same family I've been hiding with, I did not know where my parents were other than that they were in hiding in The Hague, part of the country still occupied by the Germans. I knew that my sister was somewhere in the south too. It took me two months to find out where. With help, I got transportation to see her. People she had been hiding with also agreed to let her stay, and she had come back to school. Since neither of us had any money, we had no other choice but to stay where we were until our parents would be free too. I immediately had taken a crash course uh, in typing and found a job with the American Intelligence Agency because I spoke English and could type. This way, I was able to give some money to the family where I lived. I had no clothes that fit. My parents from time to time had sent a son, but all contact came to a halt that September of 1944. In February 95, I got an invitation for my aunt and uncle, my mother's brother, who had survived the war in Brussels. However, their daughter and son and law were killed in one of the camps. I went to Brussels, they bought me clothes, and for the first time, I felt like a human being again. I met some young people I knew, and we actually enjoyed ourselves. During all this time, though, I had no news of my parents. In the latter part of April 1945, seven months after my liberation, I received a letter from my parents brought to me by a former Dutch underground worker. The letter took two weeks to reach me since there was no regular mail service. The letter came from the Dutch concentration camp, uh, West Work, earlier mentioned as the transit camp. I did not know at the time what had happened to them, but they were alive. With the help from the American Intelligence Service where I worked to give me soon, some resemblance of an American uniform and some important papers and, and young we immediately set up by car to Westport. This trip of about 200 miles took us four days. Regular travel had been suspended, and since the war was not since the war was not yet over, we had to go through Arnhem and Nijmegen, where all the bridges were demolished. I found my parents, who had been free for about three weeks in the camp in relatively good health. They were not allowed to leave the camp until they had a place to stay until the war was over. I cannot describe our feeling of joy at this reunion, knowing that all four of us had survived the whole war. That's it. <coughs> Carla, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's it's always so gripping every time I hear it. I think this is the second time that I've actually been able to hear you speak and I, I've written so many notes down. So now I'd like to ask anybody out there in virtual land, if you have any questions for Carla, just type them into the YouTube chat and we'll be happy to relay them over to Carla. Absolutely amazing. Did your parents ever really talk to you 
about their experience in Westerberg? Did they talk to you about what the, they had experienced in the camp? Or yes, were they my father wrote a paper in Dutch, of course, which I had, still have uh, about their experiences from the time they were caught and, and the time that they were liberated in Westerberg because there were no more trains on it. There used to be a train every Tuesday, and people were frightened, frightened. Is my name coming up? Is my name coming up? So glad that you have that. I have it at home, the paper. That's, I'm, I'm very glad that you do. I'm very glad that you do. Um, Alicia or Alicia would like to know what happened to your family after you reunited? Where did you guys live? What did you guys do after you reunited? Well, with your family? Um, the, the business my father um, had was totally uh, uh, gone, and as was my grandfather, I talked about um, and and died, and a couple of other people in leadership, and they asked my father to be their vice president of sales. So we moved to Amsterdam. And we stayed in a little uh, hotel. And then um, fortunately, um, uh, we found an apartment that my grandfather owned and we moved there and two cousins who came back from the camps uh, stayed with us for a while since they didn't have any parents or their brother, they were gone. And um, it was a miracle they made it back. And then we were able to, uh, to um, move to a larger house uh, about a year later. And, um, you know, um, none of us really wanted to talk about it very much. It was over, you know, and to keep going back is just, um, we were so fortunate that quite a few of our close family uh, survived wherever they were. Uh, I had a, a um, cousin who, um, whose sister was gone, but he was able to get into Switzerland and to England and join the army against the Germans. Yeah, so. so then, you know, um, I first took a secretarial a year for, to, to have a secretarial course where I, it was more than a, 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 a typewriter and, and a shorthand. I mean, it gave uh, languages um, a, a long time because I had this this, this obsessive thought that I have to be able to um, earn my earnings so I can live if something terrible still happens. And then I went to the University of Amsterdam. And my sister went back, she had to go back to high school for a couple of years. She was always two years you know, you know, was in two years different in, in school. Thank you for that. Um, folks, just feel free to ask whatever questions you have. I'm, I have a few questions. So while we're waiting for any other questions to pop up, I'll ask you my questions, Carla. Did I understand you to say that you weren't really able to save any family photos? Yeah, well, I, I did stay with him, but when his son got so heavily uh, involved in the underground, it sometimes was, I couldn't stay there. Now, I, she, the woman where I stayed, had a lot of sisters and brothers in the area, so I would go there on my bike and sometimes in the middle of the night and stay there. And then when it was safer, I would go back. But it got 
very hot, just uh, as I said, the liberation. Um, so I was, I couldn't stay. And then they came looking for Jan. Now, you know, you don't know what didn't happen, fortunately. Um, they were looking for him, not for me. And the Germans had a system. They, they would uh, get somebody that was on their list. They, they, you know, they, that's why the, I have this book with the 110,000 names because they had everything the, before computers and written down. It, it, it was horrible. And, and Holland, percentage-wise, not number-wise, but percentage-wise, had the largest percentage of people who were ill. Yeah. When did you begin sharing your story? How do I what? When, when did you begin sharing your story? How long ago did you start well, talking? Really, about um, um, I, I was um, a member of a book club in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we had to give papers. Once a month, somebody, there were 30 members, so you, you know, you got your turns. And um, February 1, 1986, that's when I actually wrote it. I always wanted to, but now I had a good reason to do it. And then a couple of years later, or three or four, I had, and I did both paper, mine and my father's at that time. And then later on, I wrote another paper about the woman who saved my sister's life. She didn't live there, but she took care of her. And somehow or other, we met again when we both were in Holland, I think when my father was there. And I just, she's still alive. And I think she's over 100 years old, but she is totally, does, is totally out of her real sad. But um, it, she went to Israel and got honored in the street of the, you know, uh, and uh, so my sister and I went to that occasion, went to, uh, to uh, Israel. But then later on, I thought I have to write this down. I have to do this. And it was pretty tough. To do and um, but I'm glad I did because I don't know how many times I've told it and I said I'll keep doing it I'm 93 years old now I'll, I'll do it until I can't do it anymore because people need to know that it really happened yes thank you so much we're so grateful for you to understand how important it is to share your story. I know that there are a lot of survivors who just, they, they can't, they can't do it. You know, they can't tell the no, details no. and it's so important. It really is. I know it's so, so hard, but it's so important to tell the story. So um, Alicia or Alicia, sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. In this book club, she says, was it when you started or wanted to talk or remember what your family's past? Um, she wants to know if you wanted to talk about this. No, no, it, um, it wasn't a book case. In fact, there were two things that the sub could not be the subject. One was books because everybody read them anyhow. And, and the other one was travelogues. It had to be you know, whatever. I, I one time thought I should write a paper of all the different toilets that seen in the world. I mean, you could just do, do anything you wanted except those two. And I tried to do something else and I said, no, I gotta do this. I have to, it took me a while, but I knew the six months I had when I had to do it, so. Um, 
And, you know, and the last one that um, I did with you, we, we had, uh, uh, I think, 360 hits people that saw it. They had a manager in, the, in my dining room. He said, my God, you're a star. <laughs> and, and I mean, there were so many people. And I, I belong to a temple here, although I'm non active person uh, in that. But I think that all the members went in and looked at it because it was on YouTube. They could see it any time. So I think that's good. We certainly appreciate you sharing your story. I know in the story you mentioned very briefly your husband. And I know he was also a survivor as well. Yes. Um, I think you spoke about it the last time in November, but how did you two meet? Oh, well, actually our mothers were cousin and I know him as a, as a child, but of course he was like almost three years old. What is that? So, he, you know. Uh, how that goes. I was, uh, um, when he was by Mitchell, I was there and, and my sister and I did, did all sorts of little skits and stuff. And, but then he also went to university uh, in Amsterdam and that's more where he lived. And so my mother thinking, you know, a Jewish mother feels, always feels about food, so she invited uh, him um, for dinner once in a while, but I wasn't always there, but it's through the school that we met he died five years ago, and he wrote a book, which is in the museum. And what's the, the title of the book that your husband wrote? In Hiding. He had, he, they had an unbelievable time. The people did it for money only. And when the war lasted a lot longer than what they thought it would be, the woman, she lived to be 104. And I believe that our library on the Lee campus has a copy of your husband's yeah. book. So, you know, if anyone is interested, certainly uh, get in contact with the library or search within the library's catalog and you should be able to rent it. Um, are there any other questions before we hit our time of 1.30 from our audience? Certainly appreciate everyone who has stayed around. Absolutely. I wanted to fangirl really quick because um, I, I've worked with Carla and Benno for a while. So I've got Benno's book here. Oh, I couldn't do <laughs> I'm <laughs> actually, it's funny, it's funny, Carla, because I had Benno sign the book. And when I had purchased it, um, William Halstead, who helped him write the book, had already signed it. So I have a book, a copy of it with both of their signatures. What are the odds of that? I must be the only person that doesn't have to, the, the signature. I never thought to ask. Yes. <laughs> I have one in, in, in English and I have one in Dutch. You know, it was translated into Dutch by a, um, a, Printer who does nothing but Holocaust things. She's not even a writer, but and um, when I went, I was I couldn't go for whatever reason. But it's so I have it in Dutch too. Um, that's that's wonderful. It's nice that you've got both copies too. Um, Gabrielle Robert says, thank you, Carla, for sharing your story with us. Thank you, Gabriella, for listening and having your daughter listen as well. I have one more question for you, Carla. Um, when I'm teaching, I often have a lot of students who ask me with the survivors that I know, how did they deal with religion after the Holocaust? And I know that, uh, Benno invited me to attend church service with the two of you 
a few years ago, we'll say, <laughs> we won't say how long ago. And it was at a universalist church, a Unitarian church. I, I am a member of the Unitarian church and they gave me an honorary membership at the temple on Sanibel, which is an island close to here where I lived for 20 years. Um, actually, I had trouble with the two, but eventually I, I said there can't be any God who permits or uh, uh, well, it's a hundred million people to die. I couldn't do it and I still can't. I just don't know. It's uh, maybe I'm somewhere in between an agnostic and a non-believer. And uh, some people, because where I stay is, is owned by a, a very religious group. But there are a lot of Jewish people right here in my community. We have something like 2,500 people live here, which is all in different buildings. But I'm in assisted living now. And, uh, you know. Life goes on until it stops. The past year has not been very easy. You know, not being able to leave my room. It's getting better because we all have our shots. 100% of the yeah, people here who live have had two shots. So that's getting a little better. That's wonderful. I to, think we're you were able to. For the chance to do this again. And, but don't come every week. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we certainly won't come every week, but we certainly appreciate you speaking with us again uh, today. Thank you. My you know, pleasure. and absolutely. Thank you. And we won't ask you to darn any socks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're playing Monopoly. <laughs> well, I'm glad that people are interested in it. I just, I hope they. They spread the word. Yes, that's your job, everyone. Millions of people said it never happens. I mean, it's the most documented thing in, in the ever been, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, okay. Thank you so much, Carla. Everyone, that's your job for, for the evening. Share, pick up the phone, get on Zoom, share Carla's story with at least four people in your life that you know. Keep the story going, keep it alive. Yes. And it will be here on YouTube, uh, as well as last year's event um, where she spoke. And at two o'clock today, we have another presenter, Judith Price, who will be talking about her experiences as well. So I'm going to end the live stream and hope to see you all in virtual land uh, for our next session at two o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Bye-bye. Okay.